we see a lot of frustrated baseball players where they start to pick up their skill specific work, whether it be on the mound stuff, weighted ball stuff, other conditioning drills, and they're not translating to the mound. And I think something that Robbie and I see a lot of, and something we talk about a lot of, is do you have the capacity to move a certain way, and then can you translate it to the mound, or can you transfer it to the field? And you know, the two drills we're gonna look at right now are gonna be looking at, can you load up that backside and actually get into that position um, on the mound, and can you actually transition those hips to be able to pivot and move properly? Yeah, I mean, what's he said about the loading up the back hip, right? I think as pitchers, like all, all we're trying to focus on in that initial dry phase is our force application to the ground, right? You hear a lot of like terminology in the sense of like ground force. So essentially, how can we really load up that back leg and then begin to transfer that in our dry phase? So something that I look at a lot is does the individual have the capacity to load up that dry phase? And that's what he was just talking about in the sense of this box, right? So if we got a guy and we were trying to accomplish that goal of loading up that back leg, and we said, hey, go single leg squat to box, and he either like gets to a certain point and then has no control, no stability, and then falls, well, it's gonna be really hard to accomplish that move if you can't accomplish it just to a, to a box. Absolutely, yeah, so Robbie's gonna demonstrate a single leg squat very simply, and not sure if you can see it with the camera here, but his heel stays hard into the ground and he controls himself all the way down. Um, again, sits himself all the way back, good vertical torso, and then brings himself back up. So the, the key here is can you control that position? Because if a coach, if a, let's call it a pitching coach, is gonna say, hey, I want you to sit into that back hip more. If you're trying to sit into that back hip, but you can't even get into a single leg squat, you're gonna have an issue transferring that onto the field. You're gonna try to rush it, and you're gonna create all sorts of other issues, which often show themselves as arm mechanic issues because maybe your arm is, is too late or too early based on the positions you're trying to get in. I think a good point too to make is, is, is the fact that like what is real versus like what is the feel, right? So even for me where I used to be a guy and early in my career where they were always telling me to stay tall, stay tall. So I would think about keeping tall on that back leg with minimal force application to get on top of the ball, right? So then when they were like, okay, well, we want you to apply more force in the ground. When I would go to do that, the feeling for me felt like I was at 90 degrees back here but in real in reality like I was maybe just minimally so that's why I love like a box even if you like lack that capacity to a really great extent um, put something on top of the box whether it be like you know a med ball and this is a drill progression that we can do for athletes that actually struggle with our force application so have like a plyo ball even if you're just throwing into a net whatever gives you really good feedback in the sense of starting that drive phase or going into the box, touching the ball, and then going into your drive phase. So just that feeling of what is the ground feeling like, how much are we loading up that back leg, touching the ball, and then going. And if you realize that you are someone that's working with a pigeon coach and you're really struggling to get into that backside, and that's something that's being worked on day in and day out, you might be better off pulling back from your pitching lessons for a couple weeks, hammering this, getting better at that load and really getting yourself to control so that when you do work on that, you're not just wasting your time and energy trying to fix your arm mechanics on top of that load, you already can get into the position. Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting dynamic too because a lot of us, we, we think so much about the, the throwing aspect and the baseball aspect of it that we do all of these type of progressions on the field where it's a lot easier to, like you said, step back in a setting like this and really just play around and explore what our movement capacity is. Yeah, so the, so the next piece is gonna be getting yourself into that external rotation. Can you own that external rotation from that back leg? Which also means you need to be able to own that external rotation from that front leg as well. So you can demonstrate yeah. that from a 90 Well, well first off, like oh. I, when, when, I, when I talked about like the drive phase earlier, right? So our drive phase starts out with our force application into the ground. And then what we wanna do is as we progress, right? As we descend and as we move laterally towards our target, we wanna hold ground connection for as long as possible. We see a lot of guys that lack that movement. They'll start getting disconnected from the backside. They'll go into early hip rotation, which obviously leaks a lot of potential power output. Another piece to that is like he said, with the hip mobility and the hip 
movement capacity is when we are in our drive phase, we want to hold essentially that external rotation of that back hip so we can constantly be applying force into the ground and then at that last second, that's when we go into internal rotation. That's when our hand gets up into that cocked position ready to fire. That's when all of the ground energy can go up at once and then that's when you hear kinetic chain and out through the fingertips at ball release. So something that I look at is like, do you have the capacity to actually move that way in your drive phase? Yep. And so Robbie's going to demonstrate a 90-90. Um, if you've followed any of Robbie's stuff, you already know that he does this quite often um, daily in his daily routine. So just getting himself in that position and then applying that external rotation to that back leg. And you're going to see that that is external rotation on the back side and external rotation on the front side. Um, where you can where you can get and be a little bit more challenging is if he opens him, his shoulder up a little bit more, you can bring your arm up and over if you want, and really just tries to keep that separation as, as long and far as possible. If this is pain-free in both of his hips, this is great. He's able to challenge it and see if we can move it a little bit more with some assistance. You'll see that his knee starts to pop up when I pull, so that actually means he's gonna have that full range to himself, which is awesome. That means he has that authentic stability to be able to control uh, that internal and external um, through the maximum range that he possibly has, which we see a lot of guys, Robbie, I'm gonna have you square up a little bit more, just like hands, um, hands both into the ground. We see a ton of guys that, that will get into this position and I say, hey, I want you to lift that knee and then they lift their knee and they get right about there. And then you'll be able to see that, that when you go to grab them, they can pull themselves all the way up. So it's not that they lack mobility, they lack stability. And I think this is where a lot of coaches struggle and a lot of athletes struggle to put all the pieces together because you can have great range of motion. We can put you on the table, and if I take that athlete and put him on the table and look for external rotation, he may have full external rotation, but he can't use it. And if you can't use it, it's not gonna help you on the field. So being able to put those pieces together and then, and then segment them out about what is moving well and what is not is gonna be able to help you determine what is the next best drill for yourself. And this is why this is why when we teach all of this stuff, it's the foundations of our strength metrics and our movement metrics that then tell us when, when we can start to implement higher level throwing drills, um, you know, throwing drills in general, and then more specific stuff that's gonna relate to the mound or flat ground or plyo drills or, or whatnot. Yeah, so what we're talking about right now is essentially active versus passive range of motion. So you'll see with me, and you saw it on the last side as well, so I'm gonna to get to the side where I'm essentially replicating my throw, right? So as a right-handed, this is how I would throw. So you're gonna see that when I hold ground connection with, with my hands, right? I, I give myself that, essentially that stability, or even like him and I were talking earlier, if you hold like a kettlebell in a rack position here or you know, in a goblet position here, but you'll notice when I go hands on the ground, I'm able to get more range than if I were to go hands off. Now I'm essentially through time and space by myself trying to get more of that external rotation. Now remember, when we're pitching in a game, on a mound, we don't have any, like a counterbalance, we don't have any stability but what we possess as a human being. So it's important to know, you know, again, I'm not in the level of him, but like for me just looking at guys, it's important to know that we need to increase our stability to be able to move at maximal capacity. That makes sense? Absolutely. And, and for those of you that follow our work you know, consistently on our own individual basis, you'll know that we talk a lot about counterbalances. Um, so a lot of times we'll take a guy and we'll say, hey, listen, you're gonna throw a baseball, but we want four pound, two pound counterbalance in that glove. Well, if Robbie doesn't have the range here in the trunk stability to have that authentic movement and we add a, add a counterbalance or a stability component, be it a, you know, a ball to hold on to while he's doing his rotations um, or a kettlebell or something like that, if his range gets better with that extra stability, we know that's a trunk stability issue. So that's what we're using and that's when we screen our guys and we say, hey, listen, you're better off using a counterbalance because you, you have the stability, you just can't use it um, without you know, applying some more force to your body. And that's where we'll get people that have a consistent you know, inverted W when their front foot hits the ground. <clears throat> we give them a counterbalance and all of a sudden it comes up because now they have that stability because they're fighting it from the front side and trying to hold that position. And again, it's, a, it's about applying, none of these tools are, are right or wrong for each athlete. It's about applying the right tool at the right time to fix 
the issue that is underlying so that all the other issues start to move forward. Yeah, I talked earlier about the kinetic energy coming up through the ground, right? We're not gonna be able to take 100% energy from the ground um, because we're just moving through time and space, but we can maximize that by really just incorporating a ton of stability, right? Like that's Absolutely. what we talked about with that trail hip flexion as well. Yep. That's why we do see a lot of guys get cleaned up with a two to three pound counterbalance in their glove, maybe like an eight, nine ounce ball in their hand because they have that aided stability. Now they're able to absorb more more of that energy from the ground out through the fingertips. Whereas before, if they don't have any stability, then they're going off you know, what, what, the, what the human body possesses, which on, on most occasions, especially with, with youth athletes is, is very minimal. Absolutely. Going back to like the box, right? For me, I think there's a mental component to the movement capacity as well. So for me, like really trying to find that like range of motion in the beginning of my trials with this, because when we first started working together, like I couldn't do this, right? Like my eccentric squat to box was like, yeah. and then I'd fall. So what really helped me was loading up like two or dual kettlebell, like bottom up stuff to provide that stability right. and then focusing on like the movement quality. And then what happened for me was like that mental component kicked in and it was like, wait, like I, I can own that range. I can have that range. And then over time you go from, you know, 16 kilos to 12 kilos to eight kilos. And then you just, right. uh, and then take it away and then boom, you're there. Yeah. So it's a process. It's the same thing with movement exercises and throwing as well. Absolutely.